I would just like to introduce this evening's webinar. Um, this was suggested by um, Jen. Um, she suggested that people would be really interested in finding out about people's experiences who have done the program or done, done a phase one of the program, gone back into their schools and are trying to put what they've learned into practice and uh, maintaining sustainable leadership in STLP after they've got back into the schools. So the suggestion is to think about what worked, what hasn't worked, and how the momentum for change in leadership has been sustained over time. And she also suggested that um, looking at these um, things through the sort of lenses of how has your science leadership contributed to enhanced and sustained science programs to better engage students and the whole school community in science, improving students' science knowledge and skills, increased science engagement of the school community, and develop links with others in the science system. And the idea is that the three of our speakers tonight have been, um, did their phase one at different times. Um, we will start off shortly with uh, Richard from, um, you're from St. Thomas More School in Tauranga, is that right? Um, Mount Monganui, yeah. Mount Monganui, that's right, okay. Um, Jeremy from Jeremy Taylor from um, Taranaki, New Plymouth um, Sacred Heart College, Sacred Heart Girls College, yep, is that right? Yeah, good evening. Good. Yep. And um, Gillian Donnelly from um, Otatara Primary School near Invercargill. Hello. So we span the country, we span the range from primary through to secondary. Um, and you've got me sitting in the middle in Christchurch um, trying to be a referee, I guess. Um, anyway, um, without further ado, oh, yes, sorry. The, the, the format that we'll do is that we'll ask, um, start off with Richard, um, who I believe was the earliest on the program. Um, and Richard will, will um, talk to us for about 10, 15 minutes. Um, with maybe some slides to illustrate what he has to say for us. And then we'll have a, um, five minutes or so for questions, depending upon how many questions there are. Then we'll move to Jeremy, we'll do the same. And then with Gillian, and at the end after Gillian's um, presentation, we can open it up to a wider discussion. Okay, does that sound fair enough? Yeah, have, we, have, we got, have we got any questions before we start? Okay, well, um, over to you, Richard. Are you happy about how to share the screen? Thank you. Um, so you can see me, can you? Yeah, we can see you. Okay, okay, good. I can unfortunately see myself. <laughs> um, I haven't got any slides, sorry. Um, we had a technical problem there, but uh, is that all right? Okay, that's fine. Cool, okay. Um, so, yes, I started before everybody else by the sounds of it. Um, and came back to school. Um, my school, we had got to the point where we were doing very little science. We had no apparatus that had just slowly worn away over the years. And so it was really from scratch for me. Um, but the good thing was that uh, having been on the STLP, um, I got a reasonable grasp of um, science capabilities. Um, I got a great sigh of relief when I realised that I could focus mostly on library of experiences and support it with the capabilities. And then the other bit which I like to do is get out and do some science and engage with science. So when I realised I only had to do those things only, um, I relaxed a little bit because I was probably one of those teachers who felt a bit snowed under with all the content. Um, and so I started in my own classroom and I just decided that I would do the best I could and I would find out who in the school was interested in, in um, doing science and wanted to partner with me. And so it was a bit of a journey for the first year. Um, but I basically started out and took, took it easy. And because we had the House of Science kits and I guess um, now as they're moving around the country, more and more people are probably able to act access those for the primary schools anyway, um, I decided that I'd use those. They were great because they were set up with the nature of science and the science capabilities. 
And so I didn't have to, I could learn as I go and my kids learned as, as we went. And also I'd learned that I didn't have to be the expert and that I could learn with them. And if we didn't understand, there was bound to be someone who could help us. Fortunately at our school, um, we had about four parents who were all um, university lecturers in science even though it was Mount Maunganui, and they were mostly marine biologists because that tends to be the, the focus over here. But they knew lots of people, um, colleagues or other scientists who could support me. And so um, I just started on this, on this journey, really. Um, and, and once I felt like I had a bit of confidence, then I decided that the best thing I could do was to present to the rest of the school some of the things that we were doing and I just started out with library experiences. And then I tried to show them that the capabilities were a, um, were a manageable way to, to think and act scientifically. Not that that was perfect, but it was a lot better than what I was used to. And I think I, um, um, I won some of them over with that. The only problem was, um, they still, the capabilities were still a little bit complex um, and I didn't know how I was going to sell it to the teachers to do science capabilities on a regular, on regular basis. So what I decided was that I would just come up with some simple um, questions within those different capabilities like what do you notice, how do you know this, are you sure, and they were really simple little things that I started with and I would practice them with my kids and then the other teachers would see me doing it and they'd go, oh, we can do that. And then it naturally sort of fanned into my reading program. So the kids, would, we would regularly use those sorts of things when we were doing um, our read, my guided reading. And I would tend to focus in on the connected curriculums and I would pick in environmental issues. And then we would start to pull those apart. And I think because of where we lived here, the kids were really aware of um, things like environmental issues, especially things like we had the RENA. Um, we had a big report come out about how many of our swimming holes were unswimmable over the summer because we didn't have enough water. And so, and that's how I sort of started it out. And the, the rest of the teachers started to see that, well, maybe we could do that. Um, and then slowly as we went along, I started to do a little bit more outside the classroom. And I started to build relationships with some of the um, parents who were really keen to get involved in some way. They were passionate about science. They wanted their kids to be passionate about science. And so um, they came on board and they were a, they were a great support to me. Um, one, because they had the expertise, but two, they knew other people who could help me. And, and they were, they because of their jobs, they were often available to come and do stuff outside the classroom. And, and that's how it started. And I thought that if I can just do these things, then maybe the other teachers would start to get involved as well. And, and that did start to happen. Um, I decided that I needed to get out and do stuff as much as possible. So with the help of a, a lady by the name of Emma, who was a marine biologist, and another lady by the name of Prathima, um, who was a marine biologist, uh, we started a regular estuary study. And so since, since the beginning of my STLP and came back to school, we've been doing two stream study, uh, two estuary studies every year. We go into the same place, we gather the data, we run out the transects, we use the quadrats, and we consistently do that. And we found the kids liked going out and doing it. The, the, the environment that we're in is reasonably plentiful of marine species. And then we would come back and then we would gather the data, we would interpret the data, we'd look at the evidence, we'd critique it, we'd present it, and, and, then, we'd, and then we'd sort of present it to other people. And as that happened, other um, people who were scientists who were involved at the uh, regional council, they heard about it and sometimes they would come along and, and help us out. Um, a couple of times the photographers came and so it started, it started that ball rolling um, where the rest of the teachers got interested. Um, and then um, as we've gone along, um, I've, I got to the point where I realised that we needed to do something about our apparatus. We were really, really short on apparatus. And so I went to the board and I asked them if they'd give us some money. So we bought measuring jugs and scales and thermometers and all those simple things that, um, that we didn't have. And teachers, when they wanted them, they couldn't find them. And so they said, oh, science is too hard. We're not going to do it. 
Um, some of the more complex things like balance, beams, um, um, it's microscopes the PTA decided to buy for us, electronics kits they bought for us. This came in time once they, um, once they saw that we were committed to the science. But so a lot of the simple stuff I just made myself out of wood. We made um, inclined planes and balance beams and things like that. It wasn't that hard to do, but it was enough to keep things going for me and keep my confidence up. And also because I, I kept going back to the capabilities, I knew that I needed to, one, get the kids to do as much observation as possible, ask those questions, and, and I needed to, we needed to gather data and we needed to use the evidence and we needed to interpret it. And, and so the kids got quite good at that. And at that time, um, the, um, the school had a rearrange, we had a rebuild, and so we went from individual classes to um, um, innovative learning environments where there were three teachers and 70, 80 kids. And that was really good because I had the support of the other two teachers and I started to model it and then they started to do it too. So that's really how we sort of, how I sort of started to engage my kids, I suppose. And because we went into a bigger classroom, it was easier to engage the teachers who then engaged the kids and it was easier to organize things. And so we'd go and we started a Rocky Shore that we did every second year, again, supported by the science teachers, the science parents who had the, had the expertise about how to do it. They'd come out and help us do it. And we gather the data and continue to use the capabilities um, so that really helped. And because we were using the capabilities, I think we were starting to think like we would do, we were thinking and acting scientifically and the kids started to, and we would start to tell the kids that they were, they were, they were the scientists. And so we started stuff like that. And that's how the program really started at our school, I suppose. Um, and so now we have a really good resource area. Um, it's, it's, it's lockable. I keep, uh, I'm in charge of it. Um, I make sure everything's there. I fix things if it gets broken. But but I've managed to keep things all in one place, and it's pretty organised. And whenever parent, uh, teachers want something and we don't have it, then I have that access to go and buy it. So the board has left me with a, a budget, um, a lot of stuff I make. Uh, we have open account at Bunnings, which I can, can use. So all those things I think have really helped um, keep things going, I suppose, at school. And it's kept my enthusiasm up and I guess it's kept a lot of the, my parents and my kids' enthusiasm up, I suppose. Um, my, this, uh, the increased science engagement in the school community has come out of that too because we've had a core um, group of parents who are reasonably expert at science. They, they also have... They weren't. They were lecturers, but they weren't teachers. So, when they came into that primary school setting, they were a bit on the back foot, and they're relying on me. But because we've consistently done things, done things like Rocky Shore, um, estuary studies, um, stream monitoring, uh, planting days. So we've done all these things, and we try and keep them rolling wherever possible. They started to understand how the primary school kids worked. And they started to take more of a leadership role, I suppose, when we would go out. So uh, we last, uh, last term we went out and did a stream study. Uh, we broke it up into different groups. And I had one of those, one of my, what I guess I call my expert science parents in one of those groups. And then I had two other parents who wanted to come along, were interested, but really didn't know what they were doing. And they tended to then show that the other parents how to do it and those those parents have built confidence up and then they will volunteer again so keeping those parents going has made such a difference and because my science parents know so many other scientists it didn't take long before it's quite easy to find some um, some support for different projects so where before I was really apprehensive about doing things now I'm much likely to go oh, I'll give it a go because there's bound to be someone out there who could help us out so, and, and again, through all this process, I keep going back to the capabilities because um, one, I want to get better at them and understand them, but two, I think it's a great way for the kids to keep thinking scientifically and it spreads out into our writing and our reading and our maths. And so that's how um, the program has been kept going, I suppose. Um, and, and as long as we keep going out and doing things, it seems to work. 
Um, and as long as we keep to the library of experiences, and I keep saying to the teachers, you don't have to be an expert, just give your kids the experiences. If you don't know how, what, how things work or, what's got, or what it is, that's fine. You can just, um, we'll ask some experts, we'll find some experts, or we'll just question we don't know why this happened and we just carry on going. We don't have to, we don't have to try and put all the pressure back on the teachers. Um, so does, that's how we've started and we just keep going. We have so whatever we're doing in school now, if it's if we've got cycle safety next term, we know we have all the kids with all their bikes at school. So we'll do velocity and force, we'll do friction, you know, we'll we'll go out on the field and we'll pour water out on the field and we'll do skids in the wet and skids in the dry. Uh, we'll, we'll try high gears and low gears, or wh whatever it is we can find that will infuse some sense of science into what we're doing. And uh, we've just found that if we just carry on looking for those opportunities, um, one, the kids have lots of fun and we all learn a lot more about science, but, um, but it keeps that flag flying in science. And I've just committed myself to doing that. I'm not trying to do anything else. I've just accepted that I'm the science person at school. And if I keep doing that and keep trying to promote science, I think that really helps, I suppose. Um, staff meetings, I've been allowed a 10 minute slot at the start of every um, staff meeting so that I can share something. Uh, this week I went back and we just talked about the library experiences again and we just pulled out that little article by Ali Ball and we just talked about what primary school teachers need to do just to reinforce to the teachers that we, we don't have to be experts, that's what high school teachers are. We can just keep giving our kids experiences and try and explain the phenomenon of the things that we see um, and use the capabilities, ask the questions and get out there and keep doing things. So that's, that's really been my goal. And as long as I can keep providing the apparatus and the, and the parents who are interested and they've got some expertise in science to, those, to the rest of the school, that seems to work. Um, so that's really what I've done so far is trying to keep the, the program going and keep the, the teachers and the community and the, the parent community going. And I think the parents are our best promoters because they come along to all different sorts of things that we do. We did orienteering and we, that came out of the fact that we wanted to do magnetism. And so we did some stuff on earth sciences and the, and the North and South Pole. And, and then we decided, well, what are we going to do where we can get as many people involved as possible and do something that the kids see science is valuable. And so we went to the Redwoods and we did orienteering. And we went there for the day. We had a, a parent night where we taught them how to, how to orientate the map and the compass. And then we went over and did a proper orienteering course over at the Redwoods. And so the parents came along and generally speaking, the parents already loved it. And then they told other parents. And so it just keeps that ball rolling. A lot of those parents are in the PTA. And they, so then because of that, when I say, I oh, can I really have some electronics kits? Can we get some microscopes? Because they see the value of what their kids are getting out of it, then they tend to, they tend to say, okay, we'll give you the money. And so it's all those sorts of things. It's so interconnected. Um, we have a little, quite a few. Uh, one of the um, parents, um, Emma, who um, was a university lecturer, she has a lot of um, students who then became land managers for the regional council. And they're in all different areas. And so they will now contact us and say, um, for an example, next term, um, they want... Um, one of the streams, they want the iwi and the regional council, they want to do a, um, a complete survey to see how many eels there are in the stream. Well, we, because we've sort of built up some reputation of doing a pretty good job, having enough parents, having good parents who keep the kids focused and organised, then so they will they contact us and say, hey, would you like to get involved in that? And so we just grab it boots and all. We change whatever's happening on the school calendar. We make sure that we go and do that. And we, again, while we're there, we keep focusing on the capabilities. And we usually, in those situations, then we do have scientists from the regional council that come along. And because they're there, the kids are really interested because they want to know all about them. And, um, and it just inspires those, ki those kids, I think, to themselves become and get involved in science in the future. 
So that's that's sort of what we've been doing generally, and we just keep plotting away of it wherever we can, and um, always contacting the regional council and saying, is there anything out there for us? We're trying to do some more planting again this uh, next term, maybe. So we always do the estuary study, uh, estuary stream study, estuary study every. Two, two out of the four terms, we do a stream study, which we share with another school, which we do every term. Uh, we do Rocky Shore every two years, and then every other opportunity that comes our way, we grab it when we can. So I think that's really what we've been doing, um, and that seems to work. The kids, uh, we went, when we first started, we had 45% of our kids um, reach the standard when we did the, um, what do we call it, um, the uh, science engagement survey and the science thinking with evidence. And the latest one we did, we had 90% of our kids were, were at or above standard. So we feel like we just keep plodding away and we're definitely making progress. Yeah, so that's what we've been doing, really. Is, Thank that... you. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Um, really inspiring listening to the, the, the way that you've got people involved and, and the way you've got parents involved and your links with um, the regional council and so on and so forth. Brilliant stuff. Just, um, I'll, I'll open it up to questions now. We, we, we need to move along a bit, but anybody got any questions of Richard? Hi, Michael. Yeah, it's Rob here down in Dunedin. Hi, hi Richard. Hey, mate. How you going? Yeah, good. Hey, thanks very much for that. It's really, really interesting. I just got a couple of questions, really. Uh, one would be, uh, um, you, when did you start doing this back at school? And, and secondly, uh, it sounds like you've really got the parents and the community involved. Um, it's, it sounds to me like that's, that's been a vital, a vital cog in what you've been able to achieve. Um, do, do you think you'd have got where you are without that community involvement? No, no way, no. Um, it's, it, it was... Um just interesting that the Emma Richardson, who had just finished lecturing um, at the University of Waikato, uh, she wanted to start an education program of her own. And so she had her little girl at the school. And so we teamed up and she, in some ways, she's she has quite a lot of control over what we do from the point of the technical um, stuff that we do but she she really wanted to promote this for herself and we also wanted to do it as a school and so um, she now is funded by the um, regional council but at the beginning it was really an experiment and we she didn't she didn't really know how it was going to work with the primary school kids and I didn't know how it was going to work with the whole process of doing the science. And so we just worked together. And she she was the one that started it. And then she had so many other colleagues that she knew and land managers. And so without them, I would never have been able to do what I, what I would have achieved so far. And of course, I had another, um, Anthony Mills also was on the STLP with me. So he he's now at a different school. But having his support helped as well. But yeah, they, they if you find your science parents or find your people in the community who are keen to help. And I learned really quickly that the Tauranga City Council and the Regional Council, you know, they are they need to be working with schools. So if you if you start asking, and they're really keen to help because they need to be doing it as well. Does that help? Yeah, cool. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you very much. When, when, did, when did you uh, do the STLP program? Uh, um, I was talking before to Michael. I think it was 2015. It wasn't long after after they changed from the year to the six months. Well, cool. Well, you've done, you've done a lot in that time. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Sharon, you've got a question. Richard, that was really, really great to listen to you. Um, I just had a question about the library of experiences and using that with the teachers because I've found I'm not as far through as you are obviously but when we introduced the library of experiences with the teachers they were still focusing on the strand as oh, opposed okay. to using the um, capabilities to plan around so how did what's your experience around that? Um, I, I just to, I think at our school, um, they had got so snowed under with doing the four different, or the five, including gauge, um, gauge, um, the nature of science, but they got so hung up on that that they'd sort of thrown the towel out. So that when when I read, oh, so we went through, we really looked at what Ali Ball had said and that, you know, that little 
two-page article that she did on library experiences, and she gives all those examples. And I really, really worked hard to say, look, this is all you need to do. The junior school, they, they, they were wrapped because they do learning with play. So they, they saw it as an opportunity just to do learning with play and try and infuse some science into it. And so they now, they have the capabilities poster and they just ask a simple little question. So, so for me, it wasn't so bad because the, my teach, the teachers at our school anyway, they, they were happy just to do experiences. You know what I mean? Thank you. Um, and and that was good. So I don't know. I just we we still try and cover the the living world and the material world in our planning in the sense that we go, oh, we've got a bit of a gap. Like we've just been talking recently, going, man, we haven't done anything on um, on space or anything for quite a while now. We really need to think about that. But we don't hold on to it too tightly. And our, my teachers at our school seem to be okay with that. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's a little bit maybe different for us because we only have the kids for two years, and so they. Oh, you're an intermediate. Yeah, so they're oh. kind of thinking, okay, we've got to do this and we've got to do this, and and they plan for the content and then fit the capabilities in rather than planning for the capabilities and using the content or the strand oh. as the. Context. Yeah, but thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, I, I think um, I was very fortunate with our principal that she she really got on board with the STLP, and I think she um, she supported me in saying, no, this is what they're saying. Do the capabilities, do the library of experience, and get out and do stuff. And I think because it came from the top, I think the teachers were more open to going, okay, we'll try this new way of doing things. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Um, Richard, sorry, I missed, I missed your name for a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's move on. Let's, um, let's hear from Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, you're from um, New Plymouth, um, secondary school teacher. So let's hear what it's like in the secondary school, please. All right. Uh, you hear me okay? Yep. Well, I did hear Richard um, refer to the secondary school teachers as the experts, so thanks for the uh, endorsement, Richard. <laughs> we, um, we, uh, I teach at a year 7 to 13 secondary school, um, Catholic girls, um, integrated school, about 710 students, and I'm uh, the head of department, and traditionally have taught mainly senior um, students, but um, since coming back from the STLP, I've really moved into um, a lot of the junior classes, which has been, been really refreshing and revitalizing, really. Um, I have, um, yeah, I attended the STLP in 2017, in the first intake. So I've just completed my uh, phase two impact report number two, um, which was, felt like quite a big weight off the shoulder just to get that document um, off to the, ministry or whoever reads it. Um, so yeah, I actually did put some slides together just so you wouldn't have to stare at me for 10 minutes. Um, I just have to make sure I can share it. So Michael, I'm just and, going yeah. to press share. Yeah, you press share. And, and, and then, then you, select, you select the app that you want to share from. Yeah. You, you, yeah, okay. So you can, Excellent. You can see this. Well yeah. done. Yeah. All good. right, thank you. And you can, and you can see the whole... if you go onto your slideshow, you should be able to just have the um, the central, the, the, the big slide. That's it. Okay. Cool. So well that, done. There we go. So that's me. Um, so I just thought I'd break it down into the what's worked, what hasn't worked, and how I managed to sustain some momentum along the way. Um, and uh, my first slide is gingerbread and sugar, because um, we started with the uh, the inspiring a shared vision. I think with a secondary school system, we've, we're already doing science. Um, we have a faculty that contains a lot of science teachers, experienced science teachers. Um, so teaching science and getting it into the curriculum wasn't the, the problem. It was getting the focus right, um, getting the nature of science front and center, and also increasing engagement. So um, that, those were my key goals when I went back to school. Um, and the first thing we did was get the faculty together and 
and have a look at what we wanted our year 10 students to be moving into year 11, um, you know, looking like, sounding like when it came to science. So um, that's the gingerbread man there. We, um, I actually have found, it was a bit of a tough read at the time, but the um, Kuzas and Posner's um, Leadership Challenge has been actually a, a good book to just refer back to every now and again. Um, the, the M-I-C-E-E, -E, the mice, um, I'm not sure if, you, if you've remembered those key chapters with that, that acronym, but um, modelling the way and inspiring a shared vision were, were two really important sort of um, aspects to get right at, from the outset. So um, we did that activity as a group. We tend to have our, our year seven to th um, 13 program. It almost does operate as an intermediate um, program, year seven and eight, and then year nine to 13. And I really wanted to try and get us working as a year seven to 10 um, junior high school unit, um, you know, with, with some real alignment in what we were doing. So um, I needed to use every scrap of time that I had available. So I found that what worked pretty well was using um, any PLD time that the, that we had been given to from the school, as well as the um, you know the, the release time we had, and um, just focus all our efforts into into that. So I got the team, the faculty to help me with my self review document. So we wrote that as a group, um, and then the development plan I put together. But you know I made sure I was communicating that fairly regularly um, with, the, with the, the people in the department. So um, that worked pretty well. Everyone seemed to be on board and just, just knowing the direction that we were wanting to head and keep turn, turning it back to that shared vision that we did together. Um, we made sure we were aligned with the school's strategic goals and that wasn't too, too hard. Um, the school you know, sent me and endorsed my application so they were right on board with that. Um, so we were able to use any appraisal time, any PLD time to really focus on our phase two goals. Um, the next thing I thought about was what, what else has worked and it's just been systematic, I think. Um, having a, a plan that's not really a two year plan, it's probably more like a five year plan. Um, one thing I did notice from doing the development plan and the review was that a lot of jargon gets into those documents. I, I tried to keep them simple, but they ended up being about four or five pages. And um, I think looking back, that probably was a, a bit of a hindrance. So last year, I just tried to cut through all the jargon and come up with a way of making, um, sort of getting the key essence of what we wanted to do out into the classrooms. So we came up with a, a shared sort of language and a simple structure, the ICI, or well, I sense, I think, I wonder. Um, so any activity we do in the junior school um, where there's some sort of science, um, you know, concept in action, we would use this language and we'd, we had a template that was based on a Pam Hook um, um, solo taxonomy template where the students would do an observation, write down their inferences of what they were thinking and then do some wonderings, which often led to some further investigation and um, data collection. Um, we found that worked really, really well. We, we use that language now from year seven to year 10. Um, the, the girls will, you know, as soon as you say, we're going to do a, a bit of an observation, they'll pull out their books or, you know, they'll know that they're about to see, think and wonder, not just um, have a bit of time to watch the teacher playing around with some chemicals or some equipment. So yeah, that's been a, a really um, good strategy. I've also found though, just to keep the momentum going that, I've had to do a fair bit of modelling, um, getting into classrooms with the junior teachers and doing some of the, the heavy lifting for them. So I plan every two weeks what we call sick science, which is just really a, a demonstration of some sort. Um, Steve Spangler, who's on YouTube, that's his website, or that's what he calls his YouTube channel. So we borrowed that name and we have like sick science Friday every couple of weeks. Um, we have a set of equipment that can be shared around and um, that just that just sort of encourages the teachers to try something they wouldn't normally try and they don't have to worry about planning it or cleaning up. So a um, couple other things that we've done, half yearly full day faculty meetings, 
um, post phase two as well. So I've got one planned uh, for early next term just to keep bringing us all together. It's really hard in a secondary system to have um, planning meetings um, with everyone present because lots of teachers are teaching multiple faculties. Um, so just every sort of two terms, bringing everyone together, sort of resetting where we're at and where we're going has been, has been a good strategy. Um, the wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, I think it's just trying to keep your head up, looking for opportunities, not getting bogged down, remembering that engagement is the key, um, is the key goal and just finding anything that you know, will be an engagement to the students. We've got some really good programs in Taranaki happening with the Curious Minds um, platform. So we've tapped into a few, a few projects that are local, the Little Blue Penguin monitoring. Um, the Regional Council has been fantastic. We've got a great um, educational outreach person there. So we've done planting and we've, we've done stream studies and we've, we've been um, pretty active in that area. Um, so things that haven't been quite as easy, I guess, in the leadership um, sort of aspect is expecting enthusiasm. Um, most people are enthusiastic when you're at the meetings. In some ways, they nod and smile and then um, said everyone goes away into their own classroom and, and back to back to normal and back to the way they've been doing things. So just always thinking about how can we really make uh, change within someone else's practice. Um, change being just that focus on nature of science as opposed to a whole lot of content delivery. Um, also, you know, you write a development plan and it, it sounds, sounds really good, but um, once again, expecting the teachers to just follow the plan um, to the letter, it's, it's not going to happen that way. So have to have to look at ways of actually making sure that development plan maintains um, its life. Um, the, the, pep, the community aspect's been quite tricky. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's a secondary school system. I think there is an aspect of the fact that um, parents almost step back a bit when their students go to secondary school. Um, we don't have them sort of coming in and dropping the kids off. I did um, do a really cool community survey at the start um, when I returned at the start of phase two. I think I got 16 responses. It was at a parent teacher night. I had boxes around the school. 16 responses, and I'm sure about six of them are from students because um, there was a few comments like, we think there should be more bomb making at school. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a bit disappointing. And so we just had to think about how we engage community um, in a secondary school. And I, I think it's more about um, using conduits or using people that are connected to organisations like the Regional Council. Um, we've got, um, and, and the Curious Minds um, groups that are, are actually doing science in the community. Yeah, so organising EOTC um, when you're working in one hour blocks with the classes that are, are moving around the school and trying not to use other people's um, time has, has been really um, challenging, but you've just got to um, you know, get to a couple of staff meetings and try and get your message out there of what you're trying to achieve. Um, I haven't got a clock with me, so I'm just trying to make sure I'm not running over time. Michael, just jump in if you need to cut me off. Um, no, you're all right, I think, at the moment. Um, okay, I've, yeah. I've only got one more slide, so. All right, mate. Okay. Yeah, um, I was just going to say the nature of science, I think, has been poorly taught for a reason. It's actually quite hard to to get a grasp of and, and you know, how, how it really looks in the classroom. So that's just a, something I think does take a lot of time and having having some simple structures like the IC, I think I wonder, just to, just to get some of the, you know, the communication and observation skills um, strengthened has, has been good. Um, and yeah, just, you know, operating in a school is always some, some other job that seems to come onto your desk when you're just about to do something with your science um, hat on. Um, so momentum over time, like I said, just um, having a plan, referring back to some, some good documents that you've collected in phase one, a couple of readings that stood out, you know, just going back and having a, having a look over, over them at some stage. Um, I found in phase two, it's really a roller coaster because you, you get yourself really worked up to get some of the um, milestones completed, the impact reports, 
and then you have a real lull afterwards and then you've got to try and sort of pick yourself back up and and, and get back um, into that mindset of really pushing yourself um really open communication with everyone in the faculty and, and being prepared to listen um but also try and get your point across strategic staffing has been really important for us um, I've, I've made sure being the head of faculty i can put myself into any area basically so i've in the last two years i've had a sample of being a year seven teacher eight nine and ten and just working with the teachers in that capacity has been really good I have regular meetings with the senior leadership team and that's been awesome just to sit down with someone who can see a bit bigger picture, um, just really have someone, a sounding board to talk to and get you to back on, on, the, on the right direction when you're maybe sort of starting to wane a bit. Um, the school's been sort of going towards a bit of a change in the way we approach curriculum. That's helped us a bit with um, looking at integration and, um, you know, get doing a bit more of the 20s, 21st century learning stuff and just overall just that enthusiasm enthusiasm willingness to give anything a go um, and not be too disappointed if it doesn't you know pan out the way you thought it would but um, just to be doing some engaging science was is the key for us I think that's it actually so um, I'm hoping I covered enough okay you that was really good and and what was really clear to me was the challenges that you have that differ from the challenges that um, people have in the primary system yeah and I guess the question that comes to me is if you had an if you were if you were had an open um, slather and you you were say the um, the principal of an innovative new secondary school mm. how would you change the overall curriculum to enable you to teach science the way you wanted to yeah I, I think um I like the idea of a junior secondary school, like a seven to ten system, to just really focus on those years that you can you can make some some big differences as far as you know the way you use the curriculum um, from year eleven to thirteen. You do start to have to change your structure um, to align yourself with NCEA. So being able to divorce yourself from the NCEA system and just focus on that would be great. Also just a bit more flexibility in the timetable. So having blocks of time, you know, a two hour block every now and again, so you can actually really get out of the classroom, um, do some stuff out in the community and get back to school without disrupting other people's curriculum time. Um, and I think actually doing a bit more cross curricular planning. So um, maybe back to the thematic approach that I think a lot of primary schools use and secondary school systems, uh, there may be some out there that do that, but um, having having those sort of science skills being used in other subject areas and, and everyone having an idea of um, you know what we're doing in science and what they can do to support us within their curriculum areas. So I'd say it would be just a, a real change up in the, the way we use time and the way we manage um, sort of the curriculum as, as opposed to silos, just open it up a bit more. I think that's probably... Um, happening in some areas but not where we are uh, could you stop sharing your screen by the way uh, yep how do i do that i oh, think yeah. you i think you go to the top of the screen and that's it good good yep. i thank you any um, more any more questions for um for jeremy stunned silence hey good <laughs> <laughs> oh, i may no, have been no. speaking too fast jeremy can you hear me Hi, Richard. Yeah. Hi. Hey, um, so I'm just interested. So um, not understanding the high school system really in the way the way high school teachers think about science. Mm. Is, is the capabilities and things like the library experience, is that quite new to them? Yeah, um, I know the capabilities is. Um, I mean, I, I think I heard about them maybe, you know, three years ago and the nature of science has always been there, but it has been the poor cousin, I guess, in the um, in the curriculum, maybe for secondary school teachers with with the contextual strands um, dominating. So um, I, I must admit, the library experiences. I'm not quite sure. Is that is that a um, is that a, a resource you use in primary school? Um, well, I guess um, for us, it's it's 
Um, it's just a series of scientific experiences where the kids get the opportunity to do observations um, so that when they get to high school, they've got there's some sort of foundation experience that high school teachers can work with. Yeah. So it's uh, the, the practical um, yeah, tasks. Very can... practical experiences of some kind that have a, that are of a scientific nature. My thought was we're, we're busy doing all this in the primary school and when they get to the high school, of what benefit are these these skills and these attitudes for high school teachers to teach our kids about science? Because we just keep doing it, hoping that somehow this is what we should be doing, you know? Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I... I just hope the students that come through our doors have experienced the science that you've been talking about because, um, you know, that's what we're trying to push at secondary school. But um, I must admit, you know, maybe 10, five, 10 years ago, these students might come to secondary school and be a bit disheartened with, um, you know, the amount of content they might have to learn and, and sort of going away from some of those um, core nature of science skills. But um, that's just sort of a generalization but we, we are, you know, I guess the secondary teachers that have been on the program would agree that um, having students that come through a system where they're really focusing on, you know, in the observation and the critiquing and, you know, the interpretation, that will make our job a lot easier. So keep doing what you're doing, Richard. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey Richard, just a quick, quickly, one thing that you mentioned that the um, in 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 your um, bit, you mentioned the um, House of Science resources. Yes, I, I don't know whether everybody knows about them. Could you just describe them briefly? Oh, okay. Um, there was a lady by the name of Chris, and she was head of department at Tar Tarana Girls College, and um, and she decided to create all these science kits that had a capabilities nature of science focus. And she's built up a massive collection and it started out in Tauranga, but now it's moving around the country and I'm not sure how many places she's actually managed to start the House of Science. Some of them have got different names, I think, but they are fantastic, especially for primary school teachers because you can just take the kits, the planning's all done, the resources are all there, the consumables there, and you can just do it. And that's made such a difference in our school because the the... the, the confidence levels have just been boosted because they can just grab the kits and use them and we just book them and I stick them in the staff room and then the teachers start playing with them looking at them and then they say oh, I might use this for my kids tomorrow or something great okay thank you any more questions of Jeremy before we um, move over to Gillian nope okay Gillian it's all yours Thank you, Michael. Do you, want, do you prefer to be called Gillian or Jill? Either. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, thank you, firstly, Richard and Jeremy. I could make connections with a lot of your experiences, um, uh, a lot of the same experiences that I'm having down here. Um, I was on the STLP in the second part of 2016 and I was hosted by the Environment Southland, which is our regional council. I'll just share a screen with you. Have you got that now? Yep. Yep. Perfect. Um, so Auditara is um, a semi-rural area. We are about five to 10 k's west of Invercargill. Um, and we're situated between the New River Estuary and Oreti Beach, which means that um, we're quite um, close to a lot of environmental stuff and we're surrounded by native bush as well. Um, before going on the STLP, um, I would say that our, we had really strong leadership in our school, so I had um, good models to follow. Um, there was a really a culture of change and that teachers were really used to being exposed to new ideas and trying out um, new ideas and we're innovative practitioners to begin with. Um, there was varying degrees of science being taught. Um, it was pretty much dependent on teacher comfort with um, and their interest in science because we have an inquiry model school but it's very much responsive and student led so um, we're not following a two year plan um, or any, any, any kind of um, reoccurring plan. 
when I surveyed our community, um, they may as well have been reading the curriculum document. They really wanted all the same things that we wanted. Um, so that was quite heartening and um, a, a good starting place. In terms of what worked, um, prior to coming back in phase two, we had been using um, some drama in school to learn primarily through literacy, but it was a good starting block to think, how might this work with science? So as I'd been situated at Environment Southland, the idea came up with the principle, what would happen if we had Environment Auditor and students would be commissioned to work on real life projects. So for example, um, the class that I taught that year, we um, put in lines to track what pests were in the reserve which borders onto our school. The year six group were monitoring waterways throughout that reserve. Um, another group were looking at the recycling and rubbish that was around the area, where was it coming from and um, what patterns could they notice and what could they do about it. Another big thing has been relationships. So our relationship with Environment Southland has, it's not just me talking to them. Uh, the teachers have just taken run with it and they will go and give them a ring or email and say, I need this or can we borrow this gear or can someone come in and help us? Um, also the relationship between myself and the colleagues, um, just really informal checking in, how's it going? I see that you're doing this. Do you want to meet for a coffee and I'll show you some, what we've got? Uh, they really liked having hands-on experiences in staff meetings. Uh, it gave, made them feel a bit more empowered that they could give it a go if they've had um, that risk-free trial with colleagues that we can have a laugh when it goes wrong and then they've had a go before they're in front of the kids. Um, I got funding from the Licensing Trust to get jewellers loops put in every classroom. So we've got good, um, that's just one example of some of the equipment that we've got that kids can access that teachers have just got on hand. They don't need to go anywhere and get it. They've just got sets of them ready to go in that teachable moment when someone brings in a hoo-hoo beetle or a cicada casing, they can stop and have a look at it. Um, also the modelling and working alongside them to help them understand or listen for those student theories and questions and how to find um, that what the next teaching step might be based on what they've noticed the kids asking or observing and noticing. Um, our teacher only days where we had a number of those coming back in, uh, a lot based around scientific drawing because we were interested in seeing how um, student drawing could um, be a way for them to access more science. Scientific writing, because we thought it was important to integrate this as much as possible so teachers didn't view it as something else they've got to do. It was this will make your writing program so much better because there's going to be a shared interest or experience that kids can draw on with lots of really great vocabulary. Um, and the, to, a lot of some te ao Māori and how we could incorporate those stories to support our science program. And once again, the teachers just love having a go themselves um, at everything that they were going to be presenting in class. Uh, the big lesson for me with the what didn't work was one size doesn't fit all and you really need to tailor pretty much everything. I, for a while, thought about using um, some Mr. Science kits that I got, I bought into the school, and I planned them all out and gave them to teachers so they could, um, they were basically spoon-fed, here's the resources, here's all the planning. Um, our teachers are used to a lot of autonomy and selecting what they like to do, so for some people they liked having that support and others, it, they just didn't get used and it wasn't really a good use of my time. Um, anything that I did that was a one-stop shop in terms of resourcing, finding some great questions and then thinking, let's put them all on little colourful cards and laminate them and put them on a key ring and then everyone can have them in their pocket. Um, that's just something that not everybody's going to want to use. And I'm a big fan of planning on spreadsheets and so I did a lot of my planning that way and shared a lot of things through a Google site that um, is just not the way everybody works. Um, also, the mental of the expert approach wasn't going to work right across the school either. As our um, junior school are uh, much more into a play-based learning approach, so 
getting them to focus on the library of experiences like the other guys were talking about was um, much more beneficial. And I was just, when I was listening to Jeremy talking about it taking time for um, teachers' practice to change, I can reflect on that now and see there are some teachers that their jaws leaps are out constantly and kids are drawing constantly and there are others that I know only teach science when I, I come up with an idea and say, let's all do this. Um, in terms of how the momentum's been sustained, I was fortunate to have a bit of a longer than average phase two. I didn't get through all my funding and um, Jen very kindly agreed to let me use some more of it in the second part of last year. So that meant that I had um, regular release and I worked quite closely with our principal and she, uh, well, we all are really interested in place-based learning and story and the arts and how we can weave all of these things together. Um, the place-based learning is really the next step for us, um, leading on from the mental, it aligns with our school values and strategic goals. I've recently become um, a member of a group that is investigating our estuary, which I think is reported to be the most polluted estuary in the country. So I'm very interested to pick Richard's brains about what he's been doing with his studies. Um, the resourcing that we were able to um, fund and provide has been a big way that the momentum's been sustained, like I said about the, them having quick access to things, but I've also moved, the science stuff previously was kind of in a couple of different areas, moved everything into one space, on shelves, labelled, you can quickly go and find what you want, and then the book's labelled to know which box to shove it back into, so that you're not standing there thinking, is this go in the living world box or in the birds box, because it could go in either, it's just shove it in there because it says which box it is on the front. Um, uh, the challenging the status quo has been another interesting one that's kept people um, interested, I think. We uh, have a lot of people talk about not having the time in their curriculum or the day, how can we get through this, and just really about thinking more uh, broadly about what you want out of your curriculum and maybe just teaching science and then looking back at what other curriculum areas we've covered in that time. Um, we are doing a lot of work in how we organise our curriculum and I team teach with another teacher in this year four and five class and she's very open to making big wholesale changes and we'll try something for a term or a half a term and have a reflection on it and feed it back to other staff that might think well we'll have a go or gosh we're not going to try that because it didn't work. Um, and empowerment was the other big note that I've made for myself about the momentum being sustained. Um, I think the students through um, a lot of the things that the, the other two guys talked about that I see, I think I wonder, um, looking at simple questions to access the capabilities has meant that the kids are much more empowered to think critically and ask informed questions and make observations about what's worked and the and they've been able to do real science that what they've worked on has been reported back to Environment Southland. Um, and they know that what they are working on, other people care about what they what their discoveries are and what their ideas are. Um, for example, some of the students' work's been published in the Environment Southland um, publications that go out to all of Southland. And uh, we've had, you know, big interview celebrations rather than a production or something at the end of the year it will be parents coming in and kids shepherding them around the school come and do this um, experience and that was all library of experiences stuff so really getting the teachers other uh, parents on board as well and the teachers of course feeling empowered to just have a go and it's not so scary and it's not going to turn everything upside down in fact it might be the answer to all of your problems <laughs> um, I have zoomed through that at lightning speed, but I'm also aware of how the time and um, it being late in the term, people might want a wee break. So, Michael, if you want to lead some questions, that's about me. Thanks, Gillian. That's great. Um, let's open it up to general. Well, for, firstly, are there any specific questions for Gillian? And then we'll open it up to general questions. I've got a question, Gillian. Yep. Um, just on assessment, how do you approach assessment in the in your, you know, school 
uh, especially around the capabilities or nature of science? Um, we don't. We have a um, I'm looking for the word like a um, a continuum, or oh, it's not the right word. I'm like progressions, or yes, yes, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Something like that. We, yeah, yeah. We we had um, science progressions prior to me coming on to the okay. And um, so I was able to go back and dig into those and see, do they actually represent what we want to in terms of the capabilities? And there wasn't much refining that needed done, to be honest. So we will look at those in terms of a whole level. So if we're reporting on science to our board at the end of the year, then that's what we'll do and we'll uh, moderate across classes. Oh, that, that was pretty handy, having those all ready to go. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and, and do you report to parents um, as do, science as a general subject? Uh, we do, if it has been a focus area for that year. Um, so it has been for the last few years. Um, and it will more so be a, a judgment on their um, attitude and effort, as well as maybe, you know, where they're at in terms of the level. But we'll talk about you know, the sorts of questions that they ask or how engaged they are and what, you know, that they're doing some deeper level thinking or that they're, you know, able to know the, um, the difference between an observation and an inference. All right, great. Thank you. Gillian, would you like to unshare your screen? Sure. When I can find the... Up at the top, should be. Thanks. <laughs> okay. More questions? Um, hi, Gillian. Um, can you, I don't know if you can hear yes, me. Okay. Um, you were just talking about science progressions. I didn't know anything about science progressions. Is there is actually some, is there? Our school had developed some. They're oh, big have on, you? Yeah, they're big oh. on progression. So um, they all are based on curriculum. Um, yeah. So oh, okay. Yeah, we've oh. got writing progressions and reading progressions that come from the literacy progressions, but I'd have to dig around and find um, what they're for. But you know what the, our science ones are based on to begin with. Yes, yes, we use the, the reading, the writing and the yeah. maths. But I, but I mean, I was thinking, oh, that's great. There's science progressions, but mm. you've, you've developed them at your school. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Mm. Great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're Would welcome. you be willing to share them, Gillian? Sure, yep. Great. So oh, if, if, you, if, if you flick them to me, I can um, yep. make them more generally available, if that's okay. Sure. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks. One of the things, um, Richard, that you mentioned was making your own gear and collecting stuff. Yes. And um, I was just wondering whether any of you guys have seen, there's a, there's a document that I got from the British Voluntary Service Overseas, which is basically science equipment um, for third world teaching. And basically it's lots of ideas of how you can improvise stuff. If anybody's interested, I'd be quite willing to put that up on the, uh, a link to it up on the Facebook pages. That would be fantastic. Yeah, I'm always looking for ideas and sometimes the things that I try out don't work as well as I hoped. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's common. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, any more questions of any of our speakers? Yeah, I'm, this is Lauren. Um, hi, guys. Thank you. Those are really enlightening and a little bit overwhelming. We're just in our first part of our um, program. So just thinking about going back, I've got a couple of random questions. Um, both Richard and Gillian said about collecting data and doing it quite regularly. Um, we were talking about it as a school and having that data available to other, other students, like normal scientists have data available that they go and check what's been done before and then they can work from that so that there's always a thing, a regularity there. Is there anything that you're doing at school to kind of archive the data that the kids are getting? Um, hi. Um, uh, the, the lady that we work with, um, because when, as far as the estuary study goes, uh, because she has funding from the council, she's got about six or seven schools who are now, she, now that we've, or she has designed with our help, a um, good system for doing the um, data gathering, she now combines all that information and she's just starting to put it onto one spreadsheet that which can, which all the schools can access because we're all, 
um, doing an estuary study, but it's all coming out of different parts of Tauranga Harbour. So that has been outside of our, I haven't done it, but um, it certainly seems to be available. And there's other organisations that, that will make um, themselves available for us to put data on apparently, which is um, news to me, but that's what she was telling me. So you know, I think it is possible. Yeah, that sounds good. Hi, Lauren. We uh, had collected um, some of the data the kids had used in spreadsheets, but we, as part of the commission and the drama, Environment Southland came and said, this is how we want the data collected and we want it um, shared with us at this time in this way, just it was part of them being in role as scientists. Mm. Um, and Auditara pest busters, which do the um, trapping and things in the bush that we were uh, collecting data on, what was out there, just informally asked us for our results. But in class, um, in both the classes that were doing that type of monitoring, their data was always visible on the wall space, so anyone coming through could have a look and see what they were finding or noticing. Oh, oh, no, that sounds great. So two kind of different ideas there. Mm. The other question that I had, Gillian, you seem really connected with your host and that it's still really having a good relationship with it. Um, Jeremy and Richard, have you had still had connection with your host? Are they still involved with you? Or you know, how would you encourage me to continue that relationship with my host? Because at the moment you've got another, I don't know, another term with them. And I want to maintain that relationship, but are there any things I need to be doing now that, may, that that's going to happen later? Do you want to start, Richard? Um, my, my host, um, I was working for a, a titanium company and most of their stuff is reasonably hush-hush. So um, it's very hard to actually get, take, you can't take the kids in where they are working. So that's been a bit difficult. But I know some of the people, my, my mate Anthony, who worked for, um, was working for University of Waikato at the Marine Studies, um, they have been, he's just maintained that relationship and they have led him so many resources and given him lots of opportunities to do things. So um, I'm not sure where, who, who you're with, um, but usually they're really keen to maintain that relationship. Yeah, I mean, I'm with I'm with the Coastal Marina Field Centre, so in total. Oh, are you? Which is the same as what my friend, where are you? Um, I actually, my school's Waikino, so I actually have a massive commute down there, but it's been really worth it for that, hopefully that relationship that will keep happening. But they just seem, you know, they're really busy and we're so far from coast in lots of ways. It was kind of like, what can you pick up and choose that they're going to be able to use and that they're going to get some benefit from as well, like having a bit of a mutual relationship rather than just a take all the time? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so you're at the same place that Anthony was at, but of course we're right here on the ocean so it's probably a bit easier mm. um, I would try and build some relationship with with um, Tauranga City Council and Environment BOP because they're always really keen to do stuff awesome oh thanks for that if you, um, if you contact if you if you want um, if you email me um, I can give you some contacts because there's lots of opportunity land managers are always looking for schools to do stuff and there'll be um, projects over in your area, planting and stream studies that they'll be really keen for kids to get involved in. Oh, that would be fantastic. I'll do that, Richard, because that's what I guess when we chose Coastal Marine Field Centre, it was to do with our rivers to the sea. So ultimately, yes, the sea is the ultimate goal, but the rivers were surrounded by three. And so any stream study planting aspects would be fantastic. Okay, cool. Cool, thank you. I had a bit the same experience as, as Richard with my host company as well. They're a private um, company that yeah, likes to keep things fairly private. I have taken some school groups around just to have a look at their, their laboratories. But um, yeah, I think similar advice to Richard, just um, make some of those connections while you can with maybe some of the, the research institutes or councils. Um, I've had a lot more luck with places like DOC and the regional council. Mm. Um, yeah. So use your kind of your phase one time when you can go and do your networking to try and I, make connections. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, you, you might find out quite quickly, you know, who, who you can build some sustainable relationships with um, while you've got that time um, instead of having to sort of make those connections while you're back at, you're back at school. Yeah, good advice. Thank you. Trina, you've got your hand up. Do you want to... Um... I think that my question was actually just answered about the, I'm in a very specific 
um, host, I'm doing uh, pollination and honeybees. Um, did you make those connections and actually go into the other places and spend maybe a day or so there while you're in phase mark one? I, I didn't. Um, I did talk to another local teacher who had been, um, had been on the STLP the year before and he, he did put me in touch with a couple of people. So um, yeah, I did meet with one or two, but um, it was mainly when I got back to school and we're just looking for some projects like, you know, planting projects or stream studies where I just pick the phone up and talk to some people at the council and um, at DOC. Um, but now if I went back and did it again, I'd probably just do that, ring around and just see if I could come in and meet some of the key, key people in the um, organisations. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, because I've got Niwa and things like that right next door. So, yeah, yeah, take take the opportunity. Um, <laughs> go and have a coffee with someone. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, any more questions, um, JC or Sharon? Um, do you have any questions that you want to ask? Okay. Well, I guess we've um, pretty well come to the end. Um, I'd like to appreciate our three um, speakers. I've really enjoyed listening to you guys and, and I've learned heaps and I hope everybody else has. And as I said, I'll put this up onto, the, um, uh, up onto YouTube and I'll let everybody know um, when it's up there. So thank you very much, and without any more ado, I'd like to um, wish you good night and uh, see you next time. Cheers. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, thank guys. you, Michael. Thank Thanks, you, Michael. Thanks. 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 Thank you.